Well, welcome to the second installment of the Concert Lectures in Revealed Theology. Some of you will remember Professor John Webster two years ago, his visit and his series on God's presence and perfection. Some of you may well remember Dr. Kenneth Concer, the first dean of TEDS and the one for whom these lectures are named. It was Dr. Concer's vision to combine evangelical theological convictions with academic excellence, and that's the intent of the lectures that bear his name as well, all in service of the church. So it's my privilege tonight to introduce you to a theologian in the Concer mold. Professor Stephen Williams is the author of Revelation and Reconciliation, more recently, Nietzsche, the Shadow of the Antichrist. He's a former editor of the journal Thamelios, which we have taken over here at Trinity. It's online. He was born and received his early education in Wales after studying modern history and theology at the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. He went on to obtain his doctorate at Yale, thus raising the question, which college tie does he wear on important occasions? He was then ordained into the Presbyterian Church in Wales and was appointed to teach theology at the denominational college in Aberystwyth. Eleven years there were followed by three years of research at Oxford. Doesn't get better than that. And then he took up his present position at Union Theological College of the Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Probably not the easiest place to teach Protestant theology. But he responded to his situation with good theological reflexes. There's an essay he wrote entitled Making Peace and Shaping the Future, delivered last year. And in that lecture, he moves seamlessly from what Paul says in Ephesians 2 about Christ making peace in himself by creating in himself one new man in place of the two, Jew and Gentile. He moves from that to the contemporary challenge of thinking of ourselves no longer first and foremost as being this or that from the north or from the south, but rather thinking of ourselves as those who've changed our individual, ethnic, and national identities for one that's primarily located in Christ. I'll quote from that lecture. The most potent form of Christian witness is that witness which shows forth how it is that Jesus Christ gives us identity. That's potent stuff, especially but not exclusively in Northern Ireland. It's theology at its best, bringing revealed truth to bear on contemporary socio-political reality, and it speaks directly to our situation as well. So how does the gospel shape our identity? I suspect tonight's inaugural lecture will give us further insight, so please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Williams as he comes to speak to us on the topic, The Election of Grace, a Riddle Without Resolution. Well, my thanks to uh, Professor Kevin Van Hooser for his welcome and for the invitation to deliver these lectures. I'm truly privileged to be doing so. I was last in Trinity for the launch of the master's program in bioethics in the 1990s. Uh, and the only previous time I was in this area was 30 years ago or so when I, when I met Ken Kantzer. It is the only time I met him. His son, Dick, and myself were graduate students uh, in Yale together. And if you notice that I'm overweight, and even from where you are sitting, you'll probably notice that, you can blame the Kantzer family entirely for that. Because I have never eaten as much as I did on the occasion of that wedding. I went to the wedding, which was about midday, and uh, afterwards there was a reception. I attended the reception, ate well, and having eaten well, there was a tap on my shoulder, and it was Dick Kantzer saying, come on, Steve. To what? Well, he said, don't you know? Know what? Well, you're part of the wedding lunch party down in Chicago, a five- or seven-course Chinese meal or something. I have, and we want you to give thanks. I have never eaten as much in my life. So that's where I am today. It's the concerts that are to blame for that. And the way you're going so far, I'm going to be exactly the same on this trip too. But thank you for the, for the invitation to uh, give these lectures. I look forward very much to being with you for them. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. 
If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Psalm 130. And then the next Psalm, 131. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have stilled and quietened my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, Put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore, Psalm 131. These two juxtaposed psalms serve better than any other two juxtaposed psalms to set the tone which I trust is appropriate for an inquiry into the doctrine of election. Psalm 130 instructs the heart. Our approach is that of sinners who, when they discern their sin, cry out from the depths, and who, when God answers them in mercy, will ever see election through the eyes of the forgiven and undeserving transgressor. Psalm 131 instructs the mind. Its eye should not be trained too high, not because there is darkness above, but because what it seeks to see lies beyond its perceptual field in a realm of things too wonderful for me. Psalm 130 tells those who despair of their sin to wait, Psalm 131, those who despair of their ignorance to be at peace. Both end with hope and so with the thought of the future. In scripture, the future is a time of definitive apocalypsis, unveiling. Is election a riddle without resolution? If Paul slipped in here today incognito and heard the title announced for these lectures, Would he say, start at the wrong end and you will finish at the wrong end? If you start out with a riddle, you will either end with a riddle or with the wrong answer. Election is the subject of proclamation. It is part of the gospel. Karl Krauss remarked, only he is an artist who can make a riddle out of the solution. Should we say that only he is a theologian who can turn a solution into a riddle? Or should we abide with Gabriel Marcel's softer reminder of the distinction between a mystery and a problem. Or would Paul have said, of course, it is a riddle riddle without resolution now. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? It is a riddle whose resolution will be eschatological and it should not be anticipated. One thing that concerns me is that he might not have given any response that I could anticipate. And if one converts that mildly imaginative and rhetorical thought into hard mental currency, it leads us to heed very carefully the warning chorus which bids us sail carefully as we embark on our voyage into these particular seas. Whatever Paul would have said, the question of election lays some claim to occupying a special place in the history of theology amongst the many issues which divide the churches. Take two significant 20th century voices. G.C. Burkauer, admitting that the treatment of any doctrine harbors its dangers and caution is always necessary, thought that with regard to the doctrine of election, warning was especially in order. Paul Jewett, in his study, announced as early as did Burkauer in his, that there is something uncommonly persistent about the argument over election. If I were to suddenly turn this lecture into question time, Chaucer would get his question in first from the Canterbury Tales. Ask any scholar of discerning, he'll say the schools are filled with altercation on this vexed matter of predestination. Long bandied by a 100,000 men, How can I sift it to the bottom then? But since I've already filled the chapel with a number of voices, let me allow one more, that of Bullinger, to answer this question. 
For what is he, though the wisest, the cunningest, and diligentest writer of the natural history, that leaveth not many things untouched for the posterity to labor in and beat their brains about? I am not trading in natural history, and shall be even more surprised than you will be if I touch on anything in this matter hitherto untouched. But brain-beating labor, and beaten one can certainly feel, is assuredly ours to undertake. We are bound to wonder whether persistent disagreement on the question of election or predestination, any terminological distinction is reserved for another lecture, arises because something in the way that the question is characteristically set up, something common to every serious party to the discussion, needs critical examination. Election continues to divide the evangelical community in particular along lines either laid down in or developed out of the calvinist arminian debate. And of course, this is just the localization of a debate that goes much further back than that, than Protestantism itself. What can we hope to achieve in a further inquiry, given the longevity and persistence of the debate? Perhaps there is nothing for it but to take one of the well-known sides. Is there not something bordering on the comical in the supposition that someone might try either to transcend or to resolve the debate? Comedy aside, it is a priori unlikely that anything revolutionary will emerge, nor do I promise the unlikely. Nevertheless, the subject must be kept under review precisely because of the disturbing quality of disagreement about it. Three years ago, a volume appeared in the Multiple Views series that will be familiar to many of you. In this case, it was five views on election. The authors were all solid and familiar contributors on the theological scene. I picked it up at some stage, firstly, in the hope of learning from it, secondly, in the hope of getting clear on what my sixth view was, if I had one, or at least where I fitted into the five views. I started out by noting the arguments, but then began to note the strength of expression and began to underline the number of times that the word clearly or some cognate word appeared, as in scripture clearly teaches, and the other side was clearly wrong. Two of the protagonists were very close to each other, so there were really four standpoints rather than five from which the others were clearly wrong. Then I stopped underlining these words because my pen marks were causing a congestion on the pages. And I began to note instead the strength of rebukes mutually delivered amongst the participants. I shall not reproduce them. It would start us off here on the wrong note. And if I said there there was indefensibly strong language, I fear I should be speaking as pot to kettles. I can get that way myself. However, the exchange invites at least two questions. The first is, how far should anyone expect to get with contributing their perspective, fresh or familiar? How persuasive are we likely to be? This particular discussion was carried out amongst theologians who stated their unreserved commitment to the full authority of scripture and practiced their commitment by seeking to ground the essentials of their positions in sola scriptura. So, should we take our hat off to post-modernity, resist dismay, and accept, if not celebrate, difference in a wonderful world? Or should we cock an ear in the direction of Rome, past or present, and abashedly acknowledge that this is what becomes of Protestantism when an ecclesial magisterial teaching authority is rejected in principle? Or should we cast a glum and concessionary eye in the direction of those natural scientists who insist that theologians have no criteria for adjudicating their disputes? Or should we concentrate less on the theological issues themselves than on the psychological, emotional, social, political, cultural explanations of the differences or the way that they are expressed? We are faced in this debate with divergent ways of reading scripture with regard to what the essayists regard as central in scripture. I think that it is no exaggeration to say that on the author's own terms, we have three or four rival versions of Christianity here. And we've not yet begun to consider what lies outside the orbit of self-styled evangelical discussion. Whatever may be said in favor of exploring postmodernity, Rome, the scientific status of theology, or socio-psychological explanation, 
we must obviously not succumb to amnesia and must bear in mind that this cauldron is no hotter than it has been in Protestantism for centuries and medieval Catholicism for centuries before that. We sometimes speak of the fragmentation of Protestantism and appropriately so, but of course, Protestantism did not start as a unified movement which subsequently and soon broke up. It started in different centers without a stated uniform theological consensus. And from its beginning, we encounter Luther apostrophizing in his commentary on Galatians in the course of treating bodily and spiritual witchcraft, he apostrophizes that the devil hath in our time bewitched Zwingli. So strong language on soteriology is not new. If it is a task in our time to try to let some of the heat out of the kitchen, at least let us realize that there is no evidence of global theological warming in the 21st century. Still, there is something so deep-rooted about differences on this question that we must be realistic about the limits of persuasion. The second question is this. Exactly what accounts for the nature and extent of the differences expressed in this volume? which on the whole contains views broadly representative of different constituencies and not idiosyncratic views. And now it is a question which obviously takes in too much for us to answer in lectures devoted to a particular theological topic. Exegetical questions are at the center of debate. But the relevant exegetical exchanges sometimes remind me of the first soccer match in which my son proudly took part at the age of about six. It was hilarious. Apart from the goalkeeper, I hope some of you know the game after David Beckham has graced the United States with his presence. <laughs> Apart from the goalkeeper, uh, what you had was 10 small children on either side all crowded around the ball trying to kick it. As the ball cannoned off unpredictably in all directions at once, the two combatant formations would move all around the pitch like a flock of seagulls competing for one piece of bread. So in exegetical debate, we move on text by text, battle by battle. Please do not for a moment think that I'm demeaning or ridiculing the exegetical task. On the contrary, it is, as, it is foundational. And I should wish to be as much participant in it as anybody else would. Only what the lads in that game obviously needed was some order and structure to their play. And fruitful exegetical conflict when we are trying to interpret the whole of scripture obviously requires some rules of engagement. That suggests the differences are best addressed at the level of hermeneutics. And the hermeneutical task is as foundational as the more narrowly exegetical task, yet are differences here any less intractable? I do not doubt that it would be most profitable to examine meticulously competing hermeneutical frameworks in this debate. But what is more striking and disturbing than the explicit or implicit hermeneutical differences is the divergence in the way in which God himself is portrayed and understood. What overtly comes out of interpretation than what ostensibly goes into it. An experienced Christian steeps him or herself in scripture, strives for purity of heart, prays and studies diligently, then depicts the face of God as that he or she sees in the pages of Scripture. Others, similarly experienced, steeped, striving, praying, studying, do the same. They compare portraits. Not only are they vastly different, each does not see how the other can get that portrait out of Scripture. Worse still, they do not like each other's picture at all. I quote from the Princeton Review, 1842, about the theology of Nathaniel Emmons. It is a frightful child of a comely parent with just enough family likeness to make one avert the face in dread. It is not just that the portraiture lacks truth from the standpoint of the different portrayers. The one who portrays from the standpoint of the other ones has no sense of divine beauty. Now that's a serious state of affairs. We see in a glass darkly, as an older translation has it, but is Paul's enigma meant to account for such divergences as these? 
mindful of Paul's commendation of charity in this chapter of 1 Corinthians, can we yet avoid asking whether we can all be worshipping the same God? If the face of Jesus Christ is the face of God, do we have not only one Jesus and many Christs, as Don Cupid suggested long ago, but many Jesuses? Borges, a Latin American writer, 20th century, you may be familiar with him. Borges writes this. Theodorus Siculus tells the story of a God that is cut in pieces and scattered over the earth. Which of us walking through the twilight has never felt that we have lost some infinite thing? Some feature of the crucified face may lurk in every mirror. Perhaps the face died, faded away, so that God might be all faces. So does post-modernity meet us at the end of the road after all? Now, I exaggerate a bit here. Theological differences on the doctrine of God are by no means always as dramatic or productive of such dramatic responses as I have indicated. But I'm still going from that particular five views debate. And if you think I'm exaggerating, please read it for yourselves, although, of course, many of you may be familiar with it. And I'm not being critical of anyone, of course, in that debate. I'm simply remarking on what seems to appear there. I'm still going from that particular five years debate, and let me linger for just a moment longer with the options that were on offer there, because the discussants were picking up different views of God that have been adopted within orthodoxy. We find that the presenting issues pivot on four perfections that we traditionally ascribe to God, power, justice, love, and glory. These terms are conventionally employed in this debate in their English language senses, which may or may not correspond tightly with the senses of the biblical words so translated. This particular volume, and herewith we take leave of it, includes a Calvinist, Arminian, open theist, and universalist approach. The difficulty widely felt with Calvinism concerns its notions of justice, love, and glory. How can God justly ordain some to perdition? How can God lovingly not seek the salvation of all? How can God be glorified in an order where love and justice are not truly expressed? The difficulty widely felt with Arminianism concerns its notion of glory. How is God glorified when ultimately my salvation depends on my exercise of my will? The difficulty widely felt with open theism is the same. But also God's power is called into question. He cannot for no free decision, which is future. But how do we express the difficulty with universalism? Certainly, neither God's love nor God's power seem to be under threat in universalism. God's glory? Well, if we indulge in an abstract, a prioristic approach, we should ask whether God would be glorified less by the salvation of all than by the salvation of some, always assuming that atonement is the way of salvation. Can we gainsay Henry of Ghent's insistence against Aquinas in the same century, 13th century, that the perfection of the universe is scarcely diminished if all are saved, glory is not compromised? Well, perhaps we can gainsay his assistance by appeal to God's justice. Let me quote Augustine in his letter to Sixtus. If both those who are actually lost and those who were actually saved. If both were saved, Augustine says, then what is justly done to sin would not be apparent. If no one were saved, we would not know the free gift of grace. But do we need more than the Savior's death to make apparent what is justly done to sin? Now, you'll be wondering why I make haste to state the universalist response to challenges when I have not done so in the other cases. Nothing happens on whether you agree, uh, nothing hangs, sorry, on whether you agree with me at this point, but it seems to me that universalism, whether or not attached to the discussion of election in particular, prima facie achieves a more coherent account of the coexistence of the divine attributes or perfections than do the alternative positions. If that is so, it is instructive. For I, for one, presumably with many here, reject universalism on biblical grounds. 
And that means that a plausible theological harmonization of God's perfections may be one thing. Biblically-based doctrine, another. Let me rescue those statements from the host of problems that threaten to converge on them and come to the point of these remarks. At the heart of the universalist case, alongside any detailed exegetical attempts to secure it, is the belief that God both desires the salvation of all and has the power to bring about the salvation of all. Unrestricted love and unrestricted power add up to the salvation of all people. It is precisely this alleged coexistence of love and power in the Christian notion of God that has generated the problem of evil and the ensuing challenge to theistic belief. The conundrum is familiar. If God can eliminate evil and suffering, yet does not do so, his love is limited. If God wants to eliminate evil and suffering, yet does not do so, his power is limited. The presence of evil and suffering show that there exists no being who combines the love and power which God is supposed to combine. Therefore, belief in such a God must be rejected. That is a perfectly familiar line of argument to you all, I'm sure. Now, revisionary versions of or alternatives to theism have been around for a long time. But where proponents of different positions on election try to advance their case on a biblical base, they usually maintain a fairly traditional notion of God, a God of sufficient power and sufficient love for them to recognize the problem of evil as described in the conundrum. So love and power coexist with the radically unexpected, a world in which there is evil. The word unexpected, in fact, is the most inappropriate understatement. A secular world tacitly or overtly viewing life in terms of pleasure and pain, integrating moral awareness one way or another into that outlook. A secular world like, secular world like that cannot fathom the compatibility of belief in a God of power and love with the unthinkable, unimaginable, and unspeakable intensity of some forms of suffering. The Christian finds the difficulty compounded and not relieved by the thought of a God of holiness coexisting with his infinite antithesis, sin. Yet this is how it is. And there are two consequences. The first is that we are warned against trying to put much weight on any deduction about election from a consideration of divine perfections. For the facts of evil and suffering show us that love and power do not add up to the state of affairs that we should expect. The second consequence is that the very perplexity that engulfs us in this darkest and saddest of matters, evil, sin, suffering, pain, should warn us what to expect or not to expect when it comes to consideration of election. In light of evil, do we really expect an election to be a riddle which has a resolution? The fact of evil in God's world may not strictly entail that a theological understanding of election is bound in its turn to be perplexing, but it should it not somewhat condition our, our expectations. Given the inexplicability of God's love and power in a world of evil and suffering, not the inexplicability of a purely logical puzzle, but a deep existential inexplicability. Why should we approach election, and perhaps other theological topics, with an expectation that the ways of divine love and power will be intelligible to us? Of course, it has long been acknowledged on all sides that mystery of some kind encompasses election, but this needs to be underlined with a black pen symbolizing sin. To confess the mystery of evil is to confess the mystery of the providential order. And the doctrine of election has often been treated as an application of the doctrine of providence. For example, this line is run, all things happen by God's ordination, therefore election and reprobation too. The standard riposte is to say that particular evils are permitted rather than ordained. Now, it may be important for us to decide what to believe and what language to use in relation to this disagreement, but no decision we take banishes perplexity. 
if God ordained evils, how is this consistent with his goodness? If God permitted with the power to prevent them, how is this consistent with his goodness? Indeed, if permission is granted with the cosmic constancy that God grants it, how practically different is this from an active decision and ordination that things should be as they are? Now, how we answer these questions within the framework in which they're asked may be of great importance, but difficulties will remain, and we are compelled to ask about the way our language refers. To what exactly in God do our notions of ordaining, acting, permitting correspond? To my mind, nowhere is Calvin's theology more thought-provoking than when he conspicuously flags up in the Institutes a question which he does not treat there systematically, the question of God accommodating his speech in Scripture to our understanding. The late David Wright used to emphasize that the notion of accommodation in Calvin's thought functioned a bit differently in his commentaries than in the Institutes, and that quite in general we've been too negligent of the commentaries at the expense of the Institutes. But I'm going to stick to the Institutes at the moment. God's speech to us is accommodated speech. Calvin says descriptions of God's eyes and ears and so on are accommodated to our intellectual capacities. More than that, he is not angry, for he has no emotion. He does not repent, for he does not change. These are all accommodated forms of speech. But Calvin did not state to what extent, if any, accommodation applies when we treat anything approaching causal language in Scripture. If we interpret biblical language in terms of God's determinate action or permission or causation, we are employing some sort of hermeneutic. Yet it is hard to avoid the conclusion that a kind of intuition lies behind, informs, drives our hermeneutics. Scripture does not give us all our hermeneutical rules. It is not possible to prove that I'm adopting the appropriate full-scale her hermeneutic. Yet we find ourselves somehow impelled to view God in one way rather than another. And an intuition, which may not be infallible or incorrigible, an intuition governs or steers our reading of texts, even as the intuition itself is derived, as far as we possibly can, from those very texts. If then we order our thinking about election to our thinking about providence, and I make no assumption about whether we should do so or not, both hermeneutical decisions and theological intuitions are going to be involved which lie further back than those which we bring directly to the question of election. Constraints on our time over the next few days will prevent investigation of Christian belief and providence. But given its relevance to the question of election, let me declare my hand as it were. Just as earlier I stated without arguing a position on universalism, let me lay out the following briefly without elaborating argument. That's not, uh, I hope, uh, from sheer dogmatism or anything, but simply constraints of time will mean I shall quite often actually uh, uh, try to indicate why it is I'm going along certain paths without being able to give a rigorous defense of the propositions I am adopting. So here's the way I take it is appropriate to approach providence. So let me put it in a tentative way and in a summary way right now. The contrast, no, the antithesis between God and evil, good and evil, sorry, sorry. It's uh, 20 to 2 in the morning, my body time. So I'm excusing myself there. I'm a Welshman, you know, and it was said of a Welsh preacher that he dreamt he'd fallen asleep while preaching and woke up to find that he had. So I'm slightly in that frame of mind. I'm going to take my jacket off and uh, take a sip of water to wake myself up. The antithesis between good and evil is fundamental in Scripture, and the responsibilities for good and evil decisively distributed between God and humans in the opening chapters of Genesis. God made all things good. Humans introduced evil into God's world. The appearance of a created serpent in the guise of a force hostile to God puzzles. The complicity of Eve and Adam in his suggestion puzzles perhaps only slightly less. Still, the causal responsibilities of creator and creature in relation to creation and sin are established early. What we subsequently know is that God has neither eliminated evil from his world nor allowed it to flow unregulated and unchanneled. 
Humans may have a causal responsibility, but they have no decretal power. Proverbs 16, 9. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. As far as evil is concerned, it is devised in the heart. As for whether a particular evil progresses from disposition to intention, to strategy, to plan, to execution, that is not at human disposal. It was given particularly to Israelite sage and prophet to discern height and depth in human history and human action. And the outcome of discernment is the conviction that human history is not borne along by free human will, however freedom of will may be factored into it. If the external form of biblical language sometimes suggests that God disposes of or brings about good and evil in the same, same way, our appropriation of that language must be subject to the basic understanding that good and evil stand to God in an entirely different relationship from each other, that is, good and evil. The one, good, proceeds from the heart of God in an initiative toward created and fallen humanity. The other is subject to his counsel in response to fallen humanity. Its response is not without foreknowledge. Anything we then proceed to say about causation and ordination and how they are related, about decree and knowledge and how they are related, is subject to the fundamental rule. It is humans who have unleashed evil upon the world. God the good. Okay, now so much for our selective reconnaissance. Bearing in mind the two things said earlier, the intractable nature of the dispute and the widely divergent views of God which underlie them, how shall we proceed over the next few days? The systematic theologian is surely the least secure of all creatures operating within the subject called theology. Or if not insecure, a creature who has purchased his or her security at a price of high avoidance. He, let me keep the masculine as a concession to those of you who think that all this is self-referential, he cannot give his time to and may lack the competence for the detailed study and exegesis of Old and New Testaments on whose foundation he seeks to build. He cannot give his time to and may lack the competence for the detailed philosophical adumbration of logical argument whose rigor he seeks to incorporate. Historians shake their heads at his lack of learning. Missiologists and practical theologians wait skeptically to see if anything relevant will emerge. <laughs> While radicals and postmoderns won't even bother to watch his antics two-thirds of the time. Has any comparable creature ever appeared on planet Earth? the only character on the scholarly scene whose responsibility far exceeds uh, whose responsibility far exceeds his competence the devil's walking parody on all two-footed things chesterton the devil's walking parody on all four-footed things in his poem by the donkey i hope i've been an encouragement to any of you who are young or aspiring systematic theologians it makes my trip worthwhile now, I'm, I'm a member of this sorry troop. On the one hand, scripture is my authority, and exegesis is my guide, but I shall not be able to devote detailed attention to any one text over these next few days. On the other hand, the rigorous requirements of analytic philosophical argument cannot be met in the time at our disposal either. So reasons for reading scripture in one way rather than another will be indicated without offering a detailed defense and reasons for adopting one theological position rather than another indicated without a detailed demonstration. Treatment of historical theology would be quite thin. The distribution of the material and practical theology would be there. I'm very concerned with that, but it will be uneven. Now, you may think I've come a long way to offer you this lament, but the constructive point of it is a declaration of intent to press on with the task of limbing a theological approach to election in the spirit of the cancer lectureship. I'll come to the second lecture tomorrow in a moment, but the third and fourth lectures will be focused on the Old and New Testaments, respectively. In the former, that is on the Old Testament, I want to think about the history and experience of Israel, including the oft-repeated claim that election is responsibility rather than privilege. 
I shall glance at missiological trends in this connection. Then, in relation to the New Testament, I shall draw attention to the fact that predestination is contrasted not with reprobation, but with a call which is culpably refused. That will be important in my argument over the next few days, sec second part of the lectures anyway. I'm also going to suggest that if we gave the book of Revelation a greater hermeneutical role in our thinking, we might conclude that we are too prone to assume a pre-eschatological resolution to the riddle of election. Revelation might persuade us that we move too hastily to thinking we should resolve this here in our time on earth. At least those are two ingredients that go into that lecture. More things will be said. So those are lectures three and four. Come to lecture two in a minute. Someone said of Wagner's music, that is not as bad as it sounds. I hope that what follows over the next few days is not quite as bland as it sounds. So let me introduce you to someone who will be perched on my shoulder throughout these sessions, who might somewhat guide and sharpen our investigation. Although he will make a cameo appearance before then, he will feature especially in a fifth lecture. That someone is Charles Simeon. Simeon lived from 1759 to 1836. He was incumbent at Holy Trinity, Cambridge, for no fewer than 54 years. His influence in English Christianity was considerable. The great Macaulay himself, looking back over Simeon's life in the decade following his death, remarked in a letter, as to Simeon, if you knew what his authority and influence were and how they extended from Cambridge to the most remote corners of England, you would allow that his real sway over the church was far greater than that of any primate, primate, i.e. archbishop. Actually, Simeon's influence extended well beyond England, not only through the preaching and pastoral contact which ministered to so many who would later leave the shores of England, but because of his direct interest in the work of foreign missions, including the conversion of the Jews. It occurs to me, I sometimes step back. Do you lose my voice when I do that? Should I be closer? Is that all right? Is that better? A little better? Okay. Simeon was a remarkable man, an exemplar of biblical preaching, not a mention of the Christian life. Although it is not a critical biography, I think that for our personal edification, the book to read on Simeon is still the late 19th century biography by Henley Mull. Simeon's three great aims in preaching were to humble the sinner, to exalt the Savior, to promote holiness. I love the simplicities of the scriptures, he said, and I wish to receive and inculcate every truth precisely in the way and to the extent that it is set forth in the inspired volume. It is not hard to believe him when he says, I never wish to find any particular truth in any particular passage. This was a particularly telling remark in the context of the Calvinist Arminian controversy, which was lively during the course of his ministry. Simeon gathered together his sermon outlines in more than one edition. There was the helps to composition, or 500 skeletons of sermons, several being the substance of sermons preached before the university, that's all the title, produced in 1801. If you admire the snappy titles that they came up with in those market-driven days, try the next, 1819. Simeon published Horae Homileticae, or Discourses in the Form of Skeletons upon the Holy Scriptures. His more recent biographer, Hugh Hopkins, doubtless speaks for many when he says that to a modern reader, the preface to this volume is the most valuable thing that Simeon wrote. The prefaces to both the volumes bear the marks of the Calvinist Arminian strife which so grieved Simeon. He detected in it the manifestation of party spirit, and nothing he said under heaven would be more grateful to him than to see names and parties buried in eternal oblivion and primitive simplicity restored to the church. He lamented the disposition which engenders this spirit. But aside from disposition, he found error in the very search for system. The author, he says of himself, is no friend to systematizers in theology. Lay aside, beware of systematizers, said Simeon 
or as he reportedly put it in conversation, lay aside system and fly to the Bible, receive its words with simple submission, without an eye to any system, be Bible Christians and not system Christians. Now, as a systematic theologian with a family still to support, I'm not going to pledge enthusiastic endorsement of all that Simeon thinks about systematizers, but he makes at least two observations which we note at this juncture, and this is the kind of thing which has driven me a little in these lectures. So I'll be majoring on this in the fifth lecture. The first observation he makes I want to note now is that the preacher has no responsibility to reconcile truths that scripture does not reconcile, such as the fact of divine ordination and the reality of human decision. Rather, the responsibility of the preacher is to rightly apply both sets of biblical truths. Quote, it may be asked, perhaps, how do you reconcile these doctrines which you believe to be of equal authority and equal importance? But what right has any man to impose this task on the preachers of God's word? God has not required it of them, nor is the truth or falsehood of any doctrine to be determined absolutely by this, by this criterion, that is, of systematic consistency. It is presumed that everyone will acknowledge the holiness of God and the existence of sin, but will anyone undertake to reconcile them? It is possible that, that the truth may lie not exclusively in either, nor yet in a confused mixture of both, but in the proper and seasonable application of them both, or to use the language of St. Paul in rightly dividing the word of truth. This last is the preacher's task. We shall have to ask in due course whether Simeon is right, and if he was, whether the preacher's limitation applies to the theologian. Simeon did not maintain that the truths in question formally contradicted each other. He was aware of the problems of implying that, and so of impugning the integrity of biblical truth, which must be internally consistent. Indeed, we find remarks that go toward a reconciliation of relevant statements, and he believed that there was a wider system out there in Scripture than adherence to either party allowed. His point was that we neither know nor need to know how to reconcile them. The contrary motion of cogs in a machine, he said, would appear to drive it in different directions, but they do not. And we should see why not if we knew its internal mechanism. He applies this to biblical truth, whose mechanisms we should only know in glory. Our job right now is to know how truth A applies to our lives and how truth B applies to our lives not to know the relation of A to B. Simeon seizes on the point of doctrine here. I quote him again. In Scripture, there are Calvinistic principles to act on man's hopes and Arminian principles to act on his fears. Both are needful and combine to produce the right effect. Man has hopes and man has fears, and God has given us a revelation exactly suited to all the wants of our nature and exactly adapted to all our capacities. He has mercifully adapted his revelation to our dispositions, nay, even to our vices. For the desponding and broken-hearted sinner, here is a salvation not depending on his own merits or his own feeble efforts. For the sluggish or confident or easily quieted conscience, here is a salvation which we must work out, a danger of becoming a castaway even after preaching the gospel to others, a danger the one who thinketh he standeth may nevertheless fall. Give an Arminian a cup of, to the former class, give an Arminian cup, sorry, to the former class, and is poison. Give a Calvinist cup to the latter class, and it is poison. Simeon's second observation, stated here more briefly, is related to that. It is not just that conceptual reconciliation is not needed. It is also that existential reconciliation is possible. That is, the truths in question are all readily integrated in the believer's life. In observing this, Simeon appeals both to reflection on experience in general and to the experience of prayer in particular. Pious men, both of the Calvinistic, I'm quoting him here, pious men, both of the Calvinistic and Arminian persuasion, approximate very nearly when they are upon their knees before God in prayer. The devout Arminian then 
that is in prayer, acknowledging his total dependence upon God as strongly as the most confirmed Calvinist. And the Calvinist acknowledging his responsibility to God and his obligation to exertion in terms as decisive as the most determined Arminian. And that which both these individuals are upon their knees, it is the wish of the author to become in his writings. Now, in introducing Simeon, the idea is not to suggest tacit agreement with all that he says, nor indeed to orient our whole discussion to Calvinism and Arminianism. Simeon defined Calvinism and Arminianism in a loose and popular sense. He was perhaps entitled to do so if it caused no misunderstanding. But even a sympathetic biographer, more recent than Bowl, uh, Hugh Hopkins, the other one I mentioned, finds Simeon guilty of oversimplifying the issues here. Though interestingly, it seems that Simeon was never accused of being woolly in his thinking or preaching. There is no record of any such accusation. We should need to study at least 2,500 sermon outlines published in 1832. It took apparently 32 men, 16 months fully employed to produce those outlines. We'd have to study all those in order to test Simeon's notions. And uh, even with the privilege of these lectures in mind, much as I've wanted to, I've simply been unable to, to contemplate that. But we should heed his words. For the preacher and pastor, or the one whose theological thought is aligned to the preaching and pastoral ministry, is likely to appreciate best the spirit and the aim of the biblical message. Now, I've talked to Simeon tonight because uh, uh, he is the, he is the eminence grise. He's the, the gray, the slate gray, the wholesome gray eminence behind the whole series that lurks behind it. So without agreeing with Simeon, I have taken uh, some of my cues from Simeon about the way we might approach this topic. But I don't mean to exaggerate either his role in what follows over the next uh, five sessions. So in this fifth lecture, I shall summarize what I've stated above a little bit, but I shall also try to reconceptualize the way that the problem of election is usually described in relation to mercy and justice. So in the fifth lecture, I'll talk about Simeon and system and much else, and also try to reconceptualize the way in which the mercy justice question in relation to election has been stated. In the final lecture, I shall be asking, where does this all take us today? After giving time, I hope in that lecture too, to the question of assurance. Now let me conclude. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known, ekenos ex egesato. It is doubly appropriate here tonight to quote a commentator's observation on this verse. The commentator's observation is this. We might almost say that Jesus is the exegesis of God. Doubly appropriate for the commentator is from here, Don Carson, and his commentary on John's Gospel was dedicated to Kenneth and Ruth Cancer. If disagreement over election reflects different portrayals of God, where shall we first and foremost go to learn of the love, glory, justice, and power of God, but to the eternal Son made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord? This is the methodological point on which Karl Barth peculiarly insisted in making his momentous contribution to the question of election. Barth was massively Christocentric and massively influential. So dominant is he that we need to set aside a session to consider his proposal. It is humbling enough to look over one's shoulder and have Simeon in sight. The human nervous system cannot stand the prospect of Barth appearing over the other shoulder. Accordingly, we must ask whether Bart has spoken the last word on the matter or whether we must look for another. We cannot avoid reckoning with Bart, so we shall hear from and about him in the next lecture tomorrow. Thank you very much.